Now I got to put you back to sleep. That was great, wasn't it? You didn't see that coming, did you? Ha! <laughs> that was great. Hey, uh, man, I don't even want to preach after that. They can come back and sing some more. Um, we are in a series of messages called Spiritual Report Cards, but let me interrupt this to just kind of share with you something. I, I now, want, on, during the week, I walk around the church praying for it before I go into my office. It's just kind of a habit I picked up. And it just dawned on me. I mean, people are coming and going all the time. I just want to say, for those of you, you know at the end of the service that we do a time of giving, and we don't talk a lot about it. We just kind of go into it. I just want to say thank you to those of you that give. It just, you know, we give generously to the food bank. We help people that are in a homeless situation. We helped a lady pay her PG&E recently, and she's just trying to get her back on her feet. We're involved in local ministries, international, global ministries. We support all kinds of programs for people of every age and stage so that you've got something that helps you grow and invite your friends to. None of that would be possible unless you gave. And so I just want to say thank you for those of you that do that. And, and that we just, you know, this, this church really excels in that area. And I just am so, so grateful for all of you. So just thank you. Uh, as I said before, we are now kind of plowing through, uh, reviewing the spiritual report cards we find in the opening chapters of the book of Revelation. These are letters that were dictated to John by Jesus to seven groups of believers. There's seven spiritual MRI evaluations from an all-knowing Lord of the church. And really they represent an amazing gift because they essentially tell us what, what the final judgment's going to be like. It's like a teacher giving us all the answers before the final exam. We know how this is going to play out. We know what Jesus likes. We know what he dislikes when we read these letters, when we go back to the scriptures. And so contextually, uh, the, the apostle John's in his 90s. He's an old guy. Because he was a faithful leader and witness to Christ in Ephesus, the Roman government banished him to the prison island of Patmos where they wanted to leave him there to rot. And on Sunday morning, he's worshiping the Lord and he hears this thunderous voice behind him and it's Jesus. And Jesus, it's not revelations. It's just one big revelation Jesus gives of himself to John to give to the church. And it opens up with these seven letters that Jesus dictates to tell John to pass on to the churches that are found in Asia Minor that were under John's care, the church of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And we saw uh, already, if you've been with us in this series, that Ephesus was the loveless church. It was a church that did a lot, but it was sort of a cold reality. It wasn't this driving love relationship with Christ. Smyrna was a suffering church, a great report card, but they were going to enter into a period of having to pay dearly for their faith. And then we get to Pergamon, and Pergamon's the, the compromising church. It, it's the overly tolerant church that was letting too much into its assembly. Thyatira last week was the polluted church or the corrupted church. And this week we're going to look at the letter written to the church of Sardis, which is the complacent church. The church that was asleep at the wheel. The almost dead church. I was going to write the dead church, but then I thought nobody would come to the church service, so I didn't write that. And I think actually Sardis gets the worst of the seven report cards. And if churches were admitted to hospitals, this church would have to be admitted to the ICU unit because it was... It needed life support, man. It was like on its last breath. It was a bad, bad scenario. And from the outset, when we read this letter, and we're going to get to it, we're going to see that there's a little bit of a warning for all Christians and all churches, because churches are just made up of believers, that there's always a risk that even vibrant churches can grow apathetic. They can grow sloppy. They can kind of question the word of God release the basics of Christianity, and eventually they can die and just become a monument. And it's, it's amazing. Creekside Christian Church is 96 years old. Did you know that? Man, the old gal looks good for 96, doesn't she? It just, and and that's, a, that's, a, that's a praise to God because most churches that old are already dead. You have to reinvent yourself by constantly going back to your first love, constantly going back to the Word, constantly going back to the leadership of the Spirit, constantly going back to your mission over and over again. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about the letter that was written to Sardis. Let me talk to you about Sardis first. If you were the letter bearer and you were walking this postal route at a clockwise route, from Thyatira you travel about 33 miles south, southeast to the glorious city, the ancient, the famous city of Sardis, which was the capital of a, 
Lydian Empire. And you can't miss it because they've got this fortress-like rock where they built the Acropolis or the town center right on top of this big, huge rock mon monument that's 1,500 feet above the, the, the valley floor of the Hermas River Valley. So you couldn't miss this church or this place for trying. Sardis goes way back. This is a fun place to visit. You can see part of the Acropolis there, even the city walls that were built like 2,600 years ago. It's just amazing they're still there and intact. This is one of the temples in the city with the Acropolis in the background. That's my young son, Scott. you got to <laughs> like those socks and shoes because uh, that's really awesome, huh? I don't talk about it much, but... <laughs> All right. Here you are. Look, okay, are you over it now? Okay, great. All right. There's, all, there's, a, there's like a synagogue there. There's a Roman gymnasium there and a bathhouse. Uh, they minted coins that go back to 600 B.C. First place coins were ever made with Sardis, by the way. Monuments that date to the time and ministry of uh, Jesus Christ. Just a, a great place to visit. I just wanted to show you this one. Some people said, are you naked there? No, I'm not naked there. I have a shirt. I know. I feel the same way. But I just had to go inside that because here's a guy right in the marketplace of Sardis who was a Christian vendor. And so what you see is even 1900 years of Christians intermingling in their culture, buying and selling and operating as a citizen of Sardis. I mean, this is, this is pretty cool when you think about it, man. People think the church is new. The church isn't new. We've been around a long time. And so just a, just a great place to visit and a great place to see. And let me tell you a little bit about the history and the background of this letter. First of all, this is a very, very old city that goes back like 1,200 years before the time of Christ. But its heyday was about 550 B.C. when it had a very famous king named Croesus. Croesus was a good ruler and it was like wealth that just poured into the city as it was developing. Really prosperity from the Pactolus River because there's a river that, <coughs> excuse me, that flows right through town. Thanks for cutting that volume. And, and it actually delivered a plentiful supply of an alloy of gold and silver con together, which is called electrum. And, and it actually, on a regular basis, it's like California in the gold rush. I mean, it just, it was like nature itself conspired to make this place a filthy rich place because gold was dumped at their doorstep. As I told you before, they made the very first coins ever minted in the world at Sardis, okay? And they made them of gold or electrum, gold and silver connected. So it's a very, very wealthy place. And, and we're going to come back to Croesus in just a little bit. But it is the wealth that led to complacency that led to sloppiness, that led to the downfall of this city and is the trajectory our nation is on right now. Second thing that's important to learn about Sardis is it was a great trade center. It was like the center knot of five principal roads. Of People moved up and down the Hermas River Valley. It was a huge valley like the Central Valley in California. Merchandise flowed, flowed up and down this and the, the cultures mingled and money was always flying. And you got to understand this is like uh, they were the terminus city of a route that led all the way to the capital of Persia in Susa. It was like the ancient Silk Route, guys. That led into so merchandise is flowing all the time up and down this road, and even on a local level, they had a road that led north to, to, to Thyatira, west to, to Smyrna, southwest to Ephesus, uh, southeast to, to Philadelphia, and, and onto the Meander Valley. So I mean, there was just money and merchandise coming all over, the, and Sardis was right in the middle of all that, perfect distribution center. Okay. And so that would also contribute to the wealth of this city. It was just an economic powerhouse. And when the Romans came in, the Romans brought peace because they got rid of the bandits and the pirates. The Romans built roads, a postal system. So then Sardis moved from the Acropolis up on the mountain down to the valley floor where they had all kinds of room to spread out because no one's going to come and get them now. The Romans will protect them, okay? So Sardis just kept getting richer, kept getting richer and richer and richer. Third thing you need to know about Sardis is the religious influence that the Christians had to live with. It was the center of Artemis worship. Now we've run into Artemis before. She's that fertility goddess from Ephesus. Remember this gal? She's a multi-breasted fertility goddess whose worship was like this wild, frenzied affair. Just 
just uh, gross decadence. People would go to the temple and engage in lewd sexual acts with the prostitutes or the bees, the temple bees. And they felt like if they did that, it would increase the fertility of the land, fertility of their families. So they mixed religion and immorality together. Christians had to live with this every day of their life. One of the biggest temples of the ancient world was built in Sardis to Artemis there. If you go there, it's astounding. This is pre-Greek. These are Doric columns, folks. This goes back to 560 BC. They've been doing this a long time, all right? Another thing that, uh, well, let, let me just back up and just say, uh, they found a synagogue in Sardis, so we know there was the presence of a Jewish community, but the Jews did not seem to bother the Christians here like they did in other towns. Emperor worship would have been present, but it didn't seem to be a dominant force here. What seems to be one of the big issues that would cause people to fall is the love affair of the city with the goddess Artemis. And probably some of the Christians in the church were having trouble with this, this, uh, this form of worship as well. They don't know for sure, but we're, uh, scholars are guessing on that one. The reputation of Sardis was not good. It was known even among pagan scholars as a decadent, flabby, declining people, a decadent, flabby, declining city. Its people were notorious for their loose living and their love for pleasure and luxury. And as the city grew more and more wealthy, it slowly lost its claim to greatness. And the, the reason this is important is this is the trajectory our nation is on. As we have become wealthy, we become complacent. Then we become arrogant. Then we deny God. Then we cave. It's the same trajectory over and over again. If you don't study history, you repeat history. And, and it would appear that the church had just kind of absorbed the spirit of the city as well in which it lived. The church seems to have lived with a relative peace. They would seem to be unthreatened like in other cities, but... It didn't end up being a good thing. I, I've been reading recently about the persecuted church in China because persecution is really going up in China right now. And a lot of the Chinese churches are praying for America that we would be persecuted because nothing purifies a church like persecution. I mean, that's not something you'd probably pray for yourself. But they, the Sardis, they just didn't have that, and so they had peace. Now, there's two kinds of peace. The first kind of peace is the peace of conquest and achievement and hard work. That's not the peace of Sardis. The second kind of peace is peace of the person who has sunk into a comfortable lethargy, whose dreams are dead, whose mind is asleep. This is the peace of evasion and escape. This is the peace of a cemetery. And that's why Jesus is going to say that this church is dead. What's obvious from this letter is, is that the Christian church at Sardis had passed its prime, and just like the city was on a downward slope going down, it appears the, the church was going down with the city as well. It didn't have to be the case, but in this case, it was what was going on. And then the last thing I want you to know historically about, F, or about Sardis is, is that they made a repeated mistake. I don't know if you ever make the same mistake over and over again, but they made a terrible fatal flaw mistake twice. They got caught off guard twice. In 549 BC, these, the king Croesus had built this huge fort, fortress on the very top of that, that Acropolis thing, and they were being attacked by Cyrus the king from Persia. Cyrus is mentioned in the book of Isaiah, by the way. This is Bible history, too. Cyrus marches all of his per Persian, army, Persian army all the way across Asia Minor. They want to take Sardis. It's the capital of the Lydian kingdom. But Croatia says, you'll never get me inside my city. Nah, 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 nah. And, and he hides all of his people inside the city, and they all go in there, and they just party. And it, it, it's like... It's like straight walls up. I mean, I've been there. To, there's only one little teeny tiny tongue of land from the south where you, you can walk up it, but you could, that could be easily defended by five or six soldiers. You'd just kill anybody coming up. So there was no way to get into the city because it was like straight cliffs with, with walls that went up even further. So Croesus and his people went in, and they said they'll never get in here. They'll never take us. What happens when you say we'll never be taken? You get taken, Right? So, two days into this siege, and they had plenty of water and supplies. They could have held out for years. Uh, one of the soldiers, Persian soldiers on the valley floor, was watching the ramparts of the city walls and noticed a Lydian soldier who lost his helmet over the wall and it started going down and went about halfway down the precipice cliff. 
So the soldier in the valley thought, well, okay, that's gone for good. He can't get it. But this soldier climbed over the wall and hand over hand, he knew a way that it was imperceptible with the eye to kind of climb down the face of the cliff because of the erosion, retrieve his helmet, put it on his head, and then just kind of climb back like a rock climber, get up over the fence. Guess what happened that night? A group of Persian soldiers climbed up that almost imperceptible pathway created by erosion up and went straight up over the highest part of the wall which was unguarded that night because of their arrogance. They said, they'll never take us from this direction. They were drinking and in debauchery that night. It was a bloodless coup and the Persians took the Lydian capital of Sardis in a night. You ever heard the expression, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. It happened again. 250 years later, Antiochus the Great came against Sardis. They hid inside the Acropolis saying, you'll never get us. Nah, 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 nah. They hid behind the city walls. And guess what happened? The same place, the same details, details, arrogance, complacency, and erosion. And they took the city like a thief in the night for the second time in the second place with the same strategy. You got to be kidding. There's a spiritual principle in there somewhere, right? And here it is. Pride and complacency lead to spiritual disaster. I mean, we're just told that flat out in the Proverbs. King Solomon told us this a thousand years before Christ. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. This isn't just true for cities. This is true for nations. This is true for churches. This is true for Christians. A little slippage, a little erosion, a little sloppiness, a little complacency. And the thief in the night can take you when you least expect it. That's a powerful lesson from this church. And it's a beautiful setup for reading the, the letter that Jesus dictates to John for the church at Sardis. Chapter 3, verse 1. To the messenger of the church of Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up! Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Obey it and repent. <clears throat> but if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. It's a reference to their historic negligence as a city. Yet, and I love verse 4, here's your ray of hope. Yet, you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white, and I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Powerful letter. Not a particularly pleasant letter. But as I've told you before, the, the structure, symmetry, outline is pretty much the same as all the letters with the exception that there's not much good here, so Jesus jumps right into confronting what was wrong in this church. He jumps right into that, which is not good. And Jesus identifies himself at the beginning of this letter. First of all, he says to the messenger of the church of Sardis, I want you to write these words. This is like the leader, the person that would have read the letter to the church, the person responsible to the church who wasn't doing a good job. He says, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits and the seven stars. Okay? Now I'm going to take the, 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 the second one because that's an easier one and then, I'll, and then I'll spend some time with the first one. The seven stars is a reference to Revelation chapter 1 verse 20, okay? Where the seven stars are the leaders of the churches that are held in the palm of Christ. So we know what the seven stars are. These are the people that are primarily responsible for the spiritual well-being of these churches. They would have been the ones that read the letter to these churches. They would have been the one that got a good report card or a bad report card based on how they were leading too. But it's not, you notice that they're in the hand of the Lord, which is good if you're doing well. But it's not so good if you're not doing well. But then he gets to this, he says, the one who holds the seven spirits. And people scratch their head when they read, read that. They go, what in the world does that mean? Now, Bible scholars are pretty lockstep in interpreting this expression as a reference to the Holy Spirit. 
Let me explain why. In fact, some of your translations may read the sevenfold spirit of God. Okay? Because seven is the number of divinity. If you remember the mark of the beast is 666. It's three times almost God, right? God's number is seven. So seven is a number of divinity. Seven is a number of completeness. Seven is a number of perfection. And in Revelation chapter 5, it says, in speaking of the Holy Spirit, it speaks of the Holy Spirit having seven eyes with which it sees everything that's taking place throughout the whole world. So scholars are pretty pretty clear agreement that though this seems like a strange reference, it's actually a reference to the all-seeing, all-knowing Holy Spirit. Now let me explain to you why that's important as you read this letter. Because of all seven letters, this seems to be the one church that had no room for the Holy Spirit. This is the one church that kept the Holy Spirit at arm's distance and wouldn't let him into the church. And when you don't have the Holy Spirit in a church, the church is dead. You, you, am I going too fast? Okay, listen, when you die, it means that your spirit separates from your body, right? And your body decomposes, they get resurrected in the end, but that's what's called death. When the Holy Spirit is removed from the church, it's dead. And it stinks and it's decaying and it may not even know it. But that's what's going on here. So this reference of the one who holds the seven spirits of God or the sevenfold spirit of God is a reference to the fact that Jesus holds the leaders and he's also the dispensary of the gift of the Holy Spirit to the church. The church didn't even want the Holy Spirit. That's a bad commentary on a church. And then you get to the, the body of the letter and Jesus jumps right into what was not going on well. He says, I know your deeds. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Man, if there's one thing I hope Jesus never says to me, it's you're dead. That's not a compliment. I mean, this church may have looked great from the outside, might have even had a nice little church building, but God doesn't judge by externals. The vast majority of members in the church of Sardis were spiritually dead, probably not even born again. This was a sad church. So close to the time of the resurrection and that early vitality, and they're already spiritually dead. Jesus is never impressed with a well-kept mausoleum. That's what this was. A well-kept mausoleum. Here we have a perfect model of inoffensive Christianity. The unsaved in Sardis probably saw this church as a respectable, respectable group of people who neither were dangerous nor desirable. Nobody wanted to be a part of it. Uh, Warren Wearsby writes of this church. It's interesting. He says... They were decent people with a dying witness and a decaying ministry. Chuck Swindoll takes off his gloves and puts on his humor and describes this dead church this way. He says, don't go to that church, it's dead. What exactly does that mean? Well, maybe it means that their sanctuary is a morgue with a steeple on top. It's, con it's a congregation of corpses with undertakers for ushers, embalmers for elders, and morticians for ministers. They sing amazing grave, how sweet the ground. You might describe their worship as stiff. <laughs> At the rapture, they might be the first church to go because the Bible says the dead in Christ will rise first. They drive to church in one long line with their headlights on, and whenever someone joins their membership, the church office immediately notifies their next of kin. Each week they put, on, put an ad in the newspaper in the obituary column. Their church van is a black hearse and their church sign is a tombstone. And their motto is, many are called and a few are frozen. <laughs> okay, uh, but, and it is funny and, and then it's not, right? Because there's nothing funny about a dead church. We drive by dead churches almost every day of our life. I'm not saying every church is dead, and I'm not going to name churches. But there are certain things that churches do that put them on a death spiral. And so I want to talk a little bit about that because, quite frankly, we need to know this. We need to be aware. What are the signs of a church when it's on its death spiral? Because history just repeats itself. The themes are always the same. Times may change, but the themes don't change. First of all, they're not trusting, and I'll get this right, they're not trusting or listening to God. They become apathetic to God. They don't, they're not concerned about the Bible. The, the Savior, Christ, His leadership is just not, they're just apathetical. They go by common sense. They go by popular, 
you know, political correctness or whatever. And then probably, probably just as important, they're unresponsive to the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit's leading them to go here, do this, give that, participate in this, they don't listen. Now listen, let's personalize this for a second. When's the last time the Holy Spirit so moved in your life that you went and did something, you gave something, you spoke to somebody, you picked up the phone and called someone. The Holy Spirit prompted you to do something because the Christian faith is a supernatural faith. It's not a natural faith. The Holy Spirit wants to animate the church, connect the body with the head Christ so that the messages get out and we do the will of God. When's the last time something like that's gone on in your life? If that is like foreign language to you, we need to pay careful attention to this letter. Thirdly, uh, churches that are dying get sloppy on faith basics. These are the ABCs of the Bible, folks. Make disciples. Worship the Lord in spirit and truth. Uh, commit yourself to knowing the Word of God through Bible studies so that you know the thoughts of God, so you think the thoughts of God and you live the thoughts of God. Prayer, you breathe it out in conversational prayer. One another fellowship, which doesn't mean coming to a church this big. It means meeting and practicing one another Christianity with other believers like we do in our life groups. Giving is a discipline that God calls all believers to. Once a week, it says, set aside something, present it to the church, evangelism, giving your faith away. These are all ABC basics of the church. If you don't see a church doing these things, it's got no mission. It's got, it's, it has no traction. It's, it's not going anywhere because this is the mission of the church to do these kind of things. And so then you find the church compromising with surrounding culture. The second you begin to doubt that the Bible is the word of God, then you lean on your own common sense. You're the ultimate authority at that point. Or political correctness is the authority. And so it is not very long before you start assimilating, like the church of Sardis, the very things that that city did itself. Okay, And, and why is this important? Because it's happening today, people. The American culture is redefining sexual norms, and we need to come back to what the word of God says. You know, as I was getting ready to come up here, I realized, how many of you are under 25 years of age? Raise your hands if you're under 25, okay? Look at all these people, okay? I have a word for you. God is for you. And, and he wants you to hold the line. And I have a word for everybody over 25 as well. Show them how to do it. Show them how to hold the line. Our, our young people aren't going to make it if the people before them aren't going to make it. We've got to show them how to do it. We've got to show them how not to cave to contemporary culture for convenience sake. And then involvement in inconsequential. Yeah, I think you can clap. I think the under 25ers can clap on that one. I just, I, I just don't like even jellyfish without a backbone. I guess I just don't, you know. Invol now, some people say, well, that's not a dead church because they're involved in all kinds of busy activities. It isn't busyness that makes you godly. You can play bingo 24-7 and stay busy. <laughs> well, let's go to Hometown Buffet for the third time today. You know, we're busy, right? Come on, man. It's, it's, it's a lot more than that. It's busy doing the right things, Right? And if you're busy, it's a busyness is not godliness. That's not a Bible verse, okay? And then finally, and this is obvious, you're going to be ineffective at reaching the lost for Christ because a church that's dead doesn't even have born-again believers in it. You can't sell what you haven't bought. You got nothing to give away. And so these are the signs of a church that's dead or dying, folks. And what's interesting is Jesus isn't going to just let that church stop without speaking into it. So look what he does. He, uh, he, he issues them a very firm warning. He says, wake up. Let me put these words on the screen. This is powerful. Jesus says, wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Obey it and repent. And I don't know if you realize this. Jesus just gave us a five-step remedy for deadness. Whether you're a church or an individual that's experiencing spiritual deadness, this is the first time it's happened in the letters too, a rapid fire succession of five commands on how to get back to life and health. It's five. Just, there's five verbs there. And by the way, they're not suggestions. They're commands. So he starts with this one. Wake up. Rise from your slumber. The inroads of sin are just like erosion. They're going to take you. Come out of your sleep. Wake up. There's this lady by the name of Mary Jane Fish. 
She was part of our church in Fresno. This is probably why I love Fresno, because of what she did. This is wild. She has this really elegant, tall husband named Noel. And, and, but Noel's health wasn't good, and so one time they took him into the hospital because he was having trouble breathing. He stopped breathing, and he died right there on the table with the doctor. And she did what I never heard a woman do before. She said, you are not leaving me this early. Whack! She just slapped him right on the face, and he woke up! He woke up! I'm not lying to you. Noel came back. What did you do that for? It's going to leave a mark. You were dead. That's why I did it. This is what Jesus is doing. Whack to the church to see if there's any life left in his wife. Now, women, this is not what I'm asking you to do when you go home. (laughs) Honey, you seem a little dead. Whack! (laughs) What did you do? Pastor Scott told me. He did not tell you to smack your man, okay? Tap him, okay? But Jesus is saying, wake up, bride. And then he says, go to spiritual rehab. He says, strengthen what remains and is about to die. There was apparently still a little bit of a foundation that was worthy of being built on. Remember the few believers that were unsoiled? Okay, now, folks, you got to understand, this wasn't the popular crowd in the church. These are the people that are harassed. These are the people that are persecuted. And Jesus said, don't laugh at them or mock them. Follow them and imitate them. They're not compromising like you. They're getting it right. Follow their example. Go into spiritual rehab. Get rid of your spiritual flabbiness. Follow the few. And then he says, remember. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Go back to the pure apostolic message of the gospel that was first preached to you. Go down memory lane and rediscover the power of God, the love of God, the beauty of God, the clarity that the scriptures brought to you, the power of the Holy Spirit as it was released into leading your lifestyle. Go back to that stuff. Remember that stuff, which reminds me. If, heaven forbid, you should ever have to move away from Elk Grove and leave this church, right? You're going to have to look for another church home. So what would you look for? Let me give you two clues, okay? The first thing I would always want to know before I ever participate in a church is, what is their approach to Scripture? Do they believe it is the inerrant Word of God, all true, for all time? And do they unapologetically preach that without hiding the difficult stuff? I want to know that. If they're not willing to do that, I'm not willing to be a part of the church, okay? Because they're already compromising. Number two, show me how they worship God. Because a church that's vibrant and alive worships God in spirit and truth. They abandon themselves with their heart, soul, mind, and strength. What I love is when our worship band cuts the instruments out and just sings, and we hear people engaged in singing here. You guys get that part? That, that's the coolest part of the worship set. Because we're not the audience. We're the performers, people. God's the audience. And it is so cool when that happens. That just gives me chills. I think, keep going, keep going. So, and then number, step number four is to obey. This is super easy, people. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey me. Jesus says, you know, uh, I want you to make disciples and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. There is no followership without obedience. Jesus said, I'm the master. Come follow me, which means obedience. This is not something that's talked about a lot in America. But Jesus expects us to obey him. And then finally, he says, repent. Now, when you repent, people, you're telling God essentially, I'm sorry. I've drifted from your ways. Perhaps you haven't read your Bible for three months. Perhaps your prayer life has just kind of gone silent. I, I don't know, but there's just a deadness in your soul when that happens. It doesn't matter if it's number five or number three. Repentance needs to be a part of that recovery process where you tell God, I'm sorry for my sorry spiritual state before you. And I, and I need you to get me back. I need you to put the fire back in me. And it's essentially, it's just a spiritual U-turn that you take as you come back to God. So let me put all of these commands into one principle. It's a big old honking principle, but here's, here's what it is. When you sense spiritual deadness in your life, admit it. Repent of your sorry condition. Go back to God's truth. Obey him and rebuild Because quite frankly, this is not God trying to tear you down. This is God trying to resuscitate you when you're almost gone. This is mercy and kindness, folks. And I've been there too, folks, where my spirit felt as dead as a doornail. 
But what would happen if this church said, no thanks? After Jesus wrote this inspired letter and it was read to the church, what would happen if the church said, eh, we'd prefer to keep things under control. The Holy Spirit kind of messes things up and makes us do stuff we don't want to do. So no thanks. Jesus gives them this warning. He says, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Has that ever happened to Sardis before? 549 B.C., a thief in the night. 250 years later, under Antiochus the Great, again. And now Jesus is saying, this is going to happen to the church. And some people think, oh, he's talking about his second return. That would be at least 2,000 years in the future. I don't really think that's what's being referenced here. I think what you've got instead is some specific form of discipline that might have even resulted in the church shutting its doors for good in Sardis. And you go, heaven forbid, the church is closing. And let me just say something you need to talk about at lunchtime. It's better to have no church than a dead church in a city. Because a dead church is a bad testimony. You follow what I'm saying? At least if there's no church, then obedient Christians from another city can go in and start a good church. But a dead church just messes up the witness of Christ. Oh, that's what Christians are? Tombstones? These are spooky things. But it, it turns because... In the middle of all of this, all of this sad stuff, there is a ray of hope in verse 4. Jesus actually says, and he's affirming what is right, he says this. He says, yet you have, I want you to say those blue words, uh, a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. You ever send kids out to play? I mean, we were just with our grandchildren this week, and, and they came home a mess. We went out into the dirt in the orchard, and they, except Lexi. Lexi really pays attention, and her clothes were without soil in the dirt. This is, these are people that do life and are not spiritually soiled like everybody else. You've you got to read into this, people, righteousness. They don't sell out to Artemis worship stuff. They don't sell out to political correctness. They hold to Christ. They hold to his word. They are they are responsive to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. You have a few people in Sardis that are precious to me. They may not be precious to you. They are my heroes. They are my people, and they are worthy. That's what he says. They are worthy. And so, you know, as I look at this, one of the things that becomes super evident is, is that given the fact that there were a few in Sardis, it's clear that Jesus expects his followers to live for him, even if we're the only ones doing so. They weren't the majority, even in the church. But that's not your escape clause for disobeying or wandering. Even if you're the only ones, Jesus says, hold on to what you have until I come, right? That's in Thi Sar Thyatira, he said that too. Jesus expects his followers to live for him, even if we're the only ones doing so. Even if we're surrounded by Goliaths and we feel like that little pipsqueak dog there, you know, around all these huge monsters. Jesus wants us to hold on. And why do we hold on? Because there are promises for the overcomers and the conquerors. Jesus actually gives four promises. He starts with the faithful few and he says of them, they're going to walk with me. They're going to be dressed in white. Walking with you. This is fascinating. Remember the Pactolus River delivered gold right to the doorstep of Sardis? Guess what? The streets of heaven will be paved with gold. It will be considered garbage. It's the asphalt of heaven. And we'll just walk on it. What is of value is communion with God. Connecting with your maker. And, and just, just friendship with God and reconciliation. You will walk with me. And you will be dressed in white. This speaks of righteousness again. Every time you hear of, you've got to know Zechariah chapter 3, Old Testament again. It speaks of the high priest in filthy clothes and then the angel redressed him in white so that he had righteous garments before God. It speaks of righteousness. But what's weird is in the book of Revelation, it says that the saints were dressed in white because their clothes had been dipped in the blood of Christ. And you think, that's not a very normal bleach. But it works with God's math. When we dip ourselves under the cleansing flood of the blood of Christ, we become spotless and stainless before God. These are people, however, that made a personal effort to stay stainless, to not be soiled or polluted by their culture, Artemis worship, the flabbiness and decadence. of. The, I suspect they were not the wealthiest in the church. I suspect they weren't the most popular, maybe not even the most publicly gifted. They were just the precious 
righteous remnant inside that church. And then Jesus says, and if you imitate these people, you like them will be dressed in white. And then he says two other things. He says, and I'll never erase your name from the book of life in heaven, and I'll acknowledge you before my Father and his angels. And people read this first, this number three promise, and they go, whoa, that's a little scary, because it seems to insinuate that someone could erase my name from the rolls of heaven. So let me just kind of give you the backstory on this, Okay. The disciples were sent out on the first missionary trip in the Gospel of Luke. They came back ecstatic that even the demons submitted to them in the name of Jesus. Jesus said, don't get excited about that. Rejoice rather that your names are written in heaven. Luke chapter 10, verse 20. Then if you go to chapter 21 of the book of Revelation, or chapter 20, verse 12, it tells us if a person's name is not found written in the book of life, they have no entry into the kingdom of God. In other words, your name must be in that book. So my question to you is, is your name in the Lamb's book of life? Do you know how you get it there? You can get your name on a church roster without having it be written in heaven. The only way you get your name written in heaven is to be completely born again to be regenerated by the Spirit of God and completely surrender to Christ and commit to living a, a, a soilless life. You're not going to be perfect. That Jesus is perfect for you. But that's how you get your name written in heaven. Have you ever done that? If you haven't, listen, you just need to call out to Christ. Go home in your bedroom and say, Jesus, help me be born again. Save me. Write my name in heaven. He'll do it when you humbly ask in faith. But here, I, want to, I got a couple of things I want to say. Because first of all, understand, this isn't written to people that are not overcomers. It's written to overcomers. And Jesus actually gives a double negative where he says, I will never, ever, ever ha- allow your name to be blotted out. So it's primarily applied to overcomers, okay? So don't try to take it out of context. However, it does seem to indicate there's a possibility that a person could lose their salvation. Now, what do you have to say about that? come back next week. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Here's what I had to say. I've been a Christian for 40 years now. I've read the Bible through year upon year upon year. I'm about one, once and a half through it this year. I'm already deep into the Old Testament second time around. And I got to tell you, the Bible teaches that you cannot lose your salvation. And the Bible teaches you can lose your salvation. I can show you texts that argue for it and convincing texts that argue against it. And I scratch my head and say, God, you must want that biblical tension tension to be in the text because you put it there. And why is it there? It's there to create a little holy fear in us so that we don't mock God. You cannot mock God. A person will reap what they sow. I have a mom that comes into my office and said, my son's been taking drugs for 15 years, blah, blah, blah. But he said a little prayer at camp when he was 12, so he's saved, right? Once saved, always saved, which is, by the way, not the Protestant Reformation motto. It's a perversion of it. It's actually once believing, always persevering. But I'll come back to that. But I said, listen, I'm not, you know, I'm, we're going to pray for your son, et cetera, et cetera. But your son has lived for the devil for two decades now. <laughs> uh, so my best read on this is he was never truly regenerated in the first place because you show me the path the person's on, and I can pretty much tell you where they're going. Right? Don't mock God. And i got to tell you also, I've told you this repeatedly, the fear of the Lord is the most beautiful thing a person can have in their life because it does not paralyze you. It frees you to live right. It's powerful. It's purging. It's cleansing. It's invigorating. And I honestly think that The only way you can actually prove that you're saved is by persevering to the end. (laughs) Really, that's the only way you really know who the true overcomers are. They're going to resist to the end. The Protestant Reformation motto was once believing, always persevering. The true saints will persevere to the end. That's why we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Okay? Now, you can wrestle with that, and you can disagree with me, and if you do, you're wrong, but it's okay. It's a, I'm, just, just, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just one person. I'm just telling you that God wants to keep us on track walking with Jesus, and when you walk with Jesus, there's no fear. When you don't walk with Jesus, be afraid. Just be afraid, people. Okay? Now I forgot where I was, so let me just... Uh, 
Okay, this is the last one, acknowledgement. Jesus says, if you, if you do these things, I'll acknowledge you before my Father and the angels. This is a direct reference to something Jesus said during his earthly ministry that's found in the Gospel of Matthew. Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. So what's the bottom line here? If you openly profess me with your lifestyle and your words, on a day of judgment, I'm standing up and I'm saying, that one's mine, Dad. That one's mine. I bought that person with my blood. That person professed me even when it was uncomfortable to do so. That person lived for me when he was ridiculed or she was ridiculed for it. That's my blood bought child. But for a person that says, well, I'm going to live a secret agent Christian and I'm just going to kind of hide my faith and tuck it under the mattress and just sort of survive until the rapture, there's nothing honoring to God about that. Jesus actually wants us, particularly when it's not easy, to profess that we belong to him and that we follow him, which is in principle form, let me just put it this way, it is critical that we all take a clear public stand for our Lord, uh, especially when it's uncomfortable to do so. And there are ways to do that that are not belligerent or obnoxious. You know, I don't think that we need to ever intentionally be obnoxious. But I think when there are conversations that arise that clearly go against the will of God, I think it's appropriate for us to say, you know, I, it doesn't play out that way in my life. Let, let me tell you, I, I'm a follower of Jesus, and I think there's a better way. And honestly, I just think you need to be light and salt. Now, um, we've covered a lot of ground in this letter. So, so what's the big take home? Why this letter in the Bible? I think this letter's in the Bible because God... Some people would say this is a letter of condemnation and they misread it. It's a letter of mercy and grace because it's late for the church of Sardis, but it's not too late. There's still a little breath left in the body, so don't drive the final na nails into the coffin. Instead, do what Mary Jane did and let Jesus <laughs> smack you back to life. Follow the recovery plan of Christ. This is a letter meant to retrieve people that are very sick and almost dead because of mercy and grace, not condemnation. And it's with that last thought, Jesus ends this letter with the same words he uses in all seven letters. He or she who has an ear, let that person hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Oh, God, I just want to thank you for the Bible. I want to thank you for the Holy Spirit. I want to thank you for the church. I want to thank you for this church. God, we're 96 years old, and I want to pray you give us another 96 years of history or more, God, if, the, if your son tarries. We just want to praise you, Lord. I pray for the people that are in my hearing right now that they would resensitize their spirits to the voice and leadership of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Father, thank you for this group that's led us in worship this morning as we give to you now and open up not just our wallets and purses, but our hearts saying you are worth more than everything and we give back a portion of what you pour into our lives. God, would you be pleased with us? We just want to say thank you this morning. Thank you for these letters. Thank you for the answers for the test before we take the test. And I would pray that we actually do what you said that we would have ears to hear and that we would hear what the Spirit is saying to your church this morning and to the churches this morning. We praise you for the redemption that is possible in Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.